Counselor Accents Podcast. Two school counselors who love their jobs. Oh, and they happen to have Southern accents too. Bless their hearts. I am Kim Crombley. And I'm Laura Rankhorn. And together we are Counselor Accents. And we have a very special guest who is a new friend to us. We just literally met two minutes ago. (laughs) But Um, we love her already. We can tell. We love her already because look at those fabulous earrings. She's from the South, and you can tell by those fabulous earrings. So, Lauren, could you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you are, and what you do? Sure. Um, uh, My name's Lauren Jewett, and I'm a special education teacher. Um, I'm originally from New York but I've lived and taught in Louisiana. I'm a special ed teacher. And um, yeah, I currently work with third and fourth graders. I've taught every grade K through five um, in the special education setting. Um, And I love what I do. Uh, um, It's one of the most uh, seeing and rewarding professions. I can imagine. Um, I never get bored with my job. Even even in this online setting, I'm not, you know, I'm finding new things to be excited about and new things to be challenged by. Um, and I am currently uh, a national board certified te- teacher uh, in exceptional needs. And I am working with Understood this year as one of their teacher fellows. So that's how I ended up writing the piece for Understood. And Understood is a organization that serves um, and provides resources to parents and teachers for children, for the one in five children who learn and think differently. So um, they put lots of resources out there to really help educators and parents um, best support students. Let's just start there since you uh, opened that subject up about understood and being an understood fellows, uh, a fellow. Um, That is not just for special education teachers, correct? This is for anyone in education. Is it K through 12? Yes. Let me ask you, Lauren, uh, for those of us who are not familiar with Understood, uh, there are amazing articles that, that I that have came through uh, Understood. And I really did not know anything about it until I found you. And, um, I see that it is a it's for all educators is that correct yeah so understood um, provides resources uh, for they're really trying to gear towards early um, career teachers so um, a lot of the resources are for teachers like in there anywhere from like first to like maybe like even 10 years just um, provide resources to them Um, and then they have a teacher fellowship and the teacher fellowship I think just started last year so I'm in the second year Um, and some of our fellows are special ed teachers and some of them are general education teachers who are just looking for um, to provide perspective on how to um, provide support to to students that learn think differently in the classroom Um, and all of the education pieces that they put out tend to be, they try to make sure that it's got an eye of a teacher on it. So anytime they're putting out an article or a resource, they have us as uh, the fellows review some of those resources um, because they really want practical knowledge to be um, going out there. uh, That is, you know, a testament to what we're actually experiencing in a classroom so that it's, again, by teachers for teachers. And, and it's you said it's for it's basically geared for students who learn differently. Yeah, students who learn and think differently. So there's a lot of resources on there for students with learning disabilities. Okay. Students have ADHD um, and all sort yeah all sorts of resources. Behavior problems does that fall under? Yes, they have. They do have resources on there. Oh, like a lot of times you can go into the the website and and. Um, search for different things like um, a lot of their articles have keywords that are connected to the article so if you're like typing for something it'll 
then generate when you go into their search engine. Um, so there's article, there's keywords tagged to a lot of their resources. And for that, so it sounds like you guys are our kind of folk that you just yeah. go a, a little further, take it a little bit further, a little extra mile there. Uh, so the way we, Laura and I found you is through, uh, we talked about this on a previous podcast, Common Sense has put out a, it's called Wide Open School. And when you, when you go to Wide Open School, um, mm -hmm. it is resources for educators, parents, students. And in fact, my little boy is on it today. It actually has day-to-day -day schedule. Uh, it breaks it down to morning things to do, afternoon things to do, even lunch things. And um, there is a social emotional aspect of this wide open school. And there, if you go to teacher anxiety, your article that you wrote, I think it came out March 17th, came, yeah. uh, came and it's, it's been placed on there. Then it's dealing with teacher anxiety. So as counselors, we feel uh, that often we are the gatekeepers, not only for the students, but also for the teachers. Right. So your article's called How I Navigate Coronavirus as an Educator with Anxiety. And I thought this was really interesting because it's coming from a perspective of someone who deals with anxiety. Um, so, tell us, I think, yeah, go ahead, Laura. Well, I think that um, this hits a need, it's such a significant need, because right there at the beginning, we were all screaming. We had purpose right there at the beginning of this whole situation where w our teachers could um, scramble and figure out how they were going to share lessons online and navigate this whole unknown world but it gave them purpose to put all these things together. Then all of a sudden reality hit and we are not going back to school this year in Alabama. Um, and I think the reality is starting to sink in now. And so this is a very timely article, even though you wrote it on March 17th, we're finding it now. And I think it's, it's something people need to know about now too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Lauren, I, as you have written that you are someone that deals with anxiety and that this is changing hour by hour. And uh, we want to, people with anxiety want to a plan. And it's yes. hard to plan. Can you address your how how I, I'm assuming you're a person who likes everything in order? Then it, it, Explain how, how you're dealing with your anxiety. Uh, um. Well, I kind of, I mean, I, I have to actually read my article a couple of times a day <laughs> or think about what I wrote, you know, because it does ground me in, you know, the, the strategies that I am offering to other educators. Um, so something that I try and do each day um, is kind of, like I said in my article, is, is doing check-ins with myself. So in the morning, like I'll check in on how I'm feeling. And then I'll do the same thing in the afternoon and the same thing in the, in the evening. And those have been really helpful because like then I can kind of assess one, how am I feeling? And then why am I feeling that way? Like what made me feel that way throughout the day? And I can kind of like, and I'm just, I'm just keeping it in. I'm, I am keeping it in a, um, a log on my computer. Um, I should probably do it maybe away from my screen since we've been having so much screen time, but I find that, I'm more apt to do it by listing it on my, um, my, on my screen and just kind of taking stock of what am I, I doing all day? How am I spending this? It seems like a vast amount of time um, that's passing. Um, and it just, you know, like when I do an, um, an afternoon check in, I'm like, oh, I'm feeling real, real tired. Like then that's a signal to me. Maybe I need to go outside and take a walk. Maybe I need to go, you know, go do something else. Um, like fold some laundry or, you know, take some, take a step away from, um, because then I'm just thinking, oh, I need to be, I'm looking outside the window. Oh, I need to go walk outside. And then I keep thinking about it and not doing it. So, uh, yeah, I think it is really hard because I am having to take it day by day, which is totally not the way that I plan. I'm a, I have a planner. I'm like 
so forward thinking. Um, my mom used to tell me even when I was in school, like take it one day at a time, take it one step at a time. And I'm just like, no, I'm thinking about like the test in three weeks, you know? And it's like, we can't even think about things right now in three weeks. So I'm trying to just find peace in what I can right control at this point. Um, and I think, yeah, for somebody who has anxiety, we want to know, we want to know when we want, and we want to know it now. <laughs> and, and, and I'm kind of just knowing that, okay, uncertainties are going to happen. And I'm just, you know, have to just kind of do what I can do. Um, so and just focusing on the things that I know I can control. I can control checking in with myself. I can control making sure I'm getting enough sleep and, and, eating and, um, and going out and getting some exercise. Like those are the things I think that I know I can count on right now. Um, so knowing those that great coping skills, I mean, those are just really good coping skills for everybody. I loved the idea of, of checking in as you call it. Um, one of the things that you said is we can have, are you, you've coined this phrase. I don't know if you coined it, but you said compassion fatigue. Oh yeah. I I thought that is such a great terminology, compassion fatigue. Uh, because for people who have overactive empathy and uh, uh empathy glands, I mean I have feel and when the news, you know, all this news that's coming in and you you feel so for the people who have lost family members and you feel for the medical profession and you feel for you know you just you 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 can put that on your shoulder shoulders and i thought what a great term is that eventually you get compassion fatigue and you need to step away so that you can come back and help others again but those check-ins are great um and you're not a counselor but you're using techniques like breathe i know i'm that. shocked I because, know it, Laura. I'm like, you're a counselor. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> so we're going to leave. We're going to step out and leave you here to just do counseling. Because we, we don't know what we're doing. For counselors. Just do the podcast. Do the thing. So, yeah, it's like you're a counselor. But, you know, I find, Laura, teachers are counselors. I mean, yeah. I've always said a teacher is a nurse, is a mom, yeah. is a daddy, is a counselor, is a, you know, we wear every hat. So um, explain to me this embrace both and thinking uh, while disrupting either or thinking. Yeah. So um, I will say I did not coin compassion fatigue. I think if you Google it, there's a lot of things out there about it, but um, I'm definitely an empath. So I think teachers before this definitely take on so much and we, we go home, I think, and got what's going on, you know, even if you don't bring work home, right. As a teacher, I've been trying to be more mindful about that, but you still think about ways to help your students when you're going home at night. Those are things that keep you up. And I think a lot of teachers are up at night thinking like, what can I be doing right now in this moment? Um, so yeah, I, I went to a workshop for teachers, um, about a year or two ago and it was led by another teacher and she um, was like a writing workshop and we like learned about dialectical thinking and there's a lot of like resources out there about dialectical behavior therapy and how that can help um, help people think of uh, their mindsets and and how their how their thoughts are racing through their head and so um, and I and it's like I think it was anxiety. It's hard to get out of your head a lot of times because you're thinking, um, you know, so the dialectical thinking is more that um, it's that you have two more two competing truths, right? That two things can be equally true at the same time. For me, it's still very empowering thing because then it's, you know, it's not, Oh my gosh, there's this like doomsday mentality. Like everything's ruined, right? Like you're actually really thinking more, like I can feel anxious or feel upset about something and I can also do X, Y, Z to like manage it. Um, like a lot of people right now, um, I know are feeling like this has happened so fast. And so people have a lot of, um, you know, just feelings about 
everything in their life that's been had to be put on hold, delayed, canceled, postponed, um, and, and, and just at least allowing space and time for people to have like some grief over that. Um, you know, and, but at the same time, like you can feel grief and feel upset and feel bummed out and disappointed that things aren't happening the way that you want them to at the same time. And right. Like have a deep obligation to like be, um, responsible to your community. Right. Like I can feel sad that, oh, I don't get to do this thing, but I'm not going to go do it <laughs> because yeah. I also have the, I, I have this obligation to my community. So it's like, it's, you know, oh, I'm so mad this didn't happen. Everything's ruined, right? That's like the, that's a, that's an either, like that's either or like thinking. But if you're reframing it, you're just really eliminating like the but. You're doing like, I, I am upset that this didn't happen. And I'm also going to like be strong for my community. I'm going to do the right thing. So it's kind of, it's kind of just the reshaping of like the language that you're that you have towards a situation. Um, you know, like, cause I've definitely even, even since I wrote the article, I've been toggling between, Oh, I feel useful right now. And then it, sometimes I feel useless because, you know, as a special ed teacher, it's really hard for us to replicate some of the things that we do day to day in the classroom. So it, that's, that's been, that that's been shaped in my head as well as this idea of like, how do I make sure I'm still holding my students accountable and being really sensitive to all the competing needs that are happening right now for them? Right. Like th those, and those are things I think I can take away outside of this situation when I go back into the classroom or prior to this is like, I want to hold my kids accountable and I want to make sure that their human needs are addressed because I know that if their human needs are not addressed, I'm not going to, even be able to scratch the surface on them critically think about a text they're reading or tackling a math problem. Like I have to make sure that, and that's been something I've been trying to, to do in my calls with families is, Hey, like, are you, you know, are you all sleeping? Are you all eating? Are you breathing? Are you, are you well? Like before asking about, you know, the, um, the types of, you know, academic pieces. I, I mean, obviously it's important to me as a teacher that they're, you know, that they're learning, but I know that that looks different right now. And we're calling that grace. We're giving grace and, and we're putting things in perspective. And, and Laura and I feel that way also that the first thing is, I mean, let, let's, let's be honest. We're going to get back to, we're, we're going to get back to all that. You know, the big picture is the big picture right now. And right. so uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate you saying that. Um, you say in the article that we have triggers and security blankets and, and, and we, you know, Laura and I have talked about that. This triggers, there are triggers that we all have and a lot of, sometimes the anxiety we're feeling, this is bringing on something else that we have experienced in the past. So explain what you mean by we have triggers and security blankets. Um, so like a, again, triggers to, um, are especially for having anxiety is like things that, you know, start making you feel like you're in panic mode or start like making you feel that you're using a sense of sense of control over something or that you feel triggered by, um, maybe something that happened in your past um, that led to some negative feelings or experiences. Uh, and, you know, th those could be deep seated. Those could be from like a long time ago. Um, they could just be something that's recent. Um, they, it could be a trigger of like, maybe something didn't happen, but you felt fear. Um, you know, so the, for me, triggering is a lot of times watching the news. I know for a lot of people, we're now on our screens a ton. So like being on the social media and, and trying to sift through a lot of noise, um, I have to be really mindful. I rarely turn on my TV um, because it is just my mind starts wandering. And so I know my personal trigger is like, you know, how much am I taking in? Because you have to really consciously consume what your, what your brain is 
thing in because then again, like I said, it, it can start spinning thoughts. And like, if right. you have, if you have anxiety, like it's just a roller coaster at that point. So I try to be really like mindful of knowing what my triggers are and triggers look different for everybody. Um, you know, so, um, I, I try you know, jot down again, that's why I do the check-ins because if I know something's making me feel a certain way, that's like, um, you know, making me feel panicked or anxious, then I know that that could possibly be a trigger for me. Um, and then like knowing my security blankets or things that are comforting for me, uh, those are on the flip side. What are the things that I check in about that make me feel good? Um, I know I feel great after I like do something good for my body. Like after I have time to do a yoga practice and I'm breathing, I'm meditating, I'm able to unplug away from all, a lot of the, the noise. I know if I'm getting enough sleep, like that's, that, that makes me feel refreshed. It makes me feel good. So I think having a, having a practice where you're able to identify what your comfort and triggers are is helpful because you might ask somebody what their triggers and comfort, you know, mechanisms are and they might not even know because they're not yet at a step of like checking in. So I think the checking in is really needs to come first because then you can start to think about w the patterns of your, your feeling and thought process. I think that those are great. I, I love the idea of checking in. I know a lot of folks deal with anxiety um, and uh, this only expounds that what we're going through right now if you're dealing if you deal with anxiety and battle that anyway in a day-to-day -day, this is something that uh, i have a child my oldest son battles anxiety and um i i can you know and for folks who have that tendency anyway um you you really have to up those coping skills to manage so i appreciate you giving us some ideas and congratulations on this article. And uh, Laura, I want if you if you don't mind, our very own Laura has uh, recently uh, she's going to put out a blog on this. And do you want to talk a little bit about your thoughts on? And 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 Lauren, you're welcome to join in on this conversation. But uh, tell us a little bit, Laura, about what your thoughts have been on this, and what some th some things that you're putting pen to paper on. Okay. Well, first I want to, I've made a few notes as Lauren has been talking and you haven't given me a chance to jump in, Kim. Um, <laughs> get really ugly, Lauren, and I'm sorry that you can see this. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say that I love the idea of making a log, the check-in log, because it is, it's making you well, first of all, it's going to serve as a journal because we are, I mean, we've heard it time and time again, this is historical. And years from now, you're going to have this to reference when people say, well, what did you do in your 2020? You're going to say, well, let me tell you at noon on March 20th, this is how I was feeling. And I just think that's going to be very valuable. That's a good, that's a good way to look at that. You're doing historical writing, Lauren, and you didn't you know. Are. This is going to be huge. I'm going to just go ahead and predict that. that this is, you're going to do something with this. Um, so I love that. But it also sort of, it requires you to identify how you're feeling. And once you identify that, then you can find the matching coping skill to go with it. But otherwise, you're just feeling, sometimes I say, Lauren, do y'all have a shoe carnival where you live? Do you know what I'm talking about when I say shoe carnival? She thinks <laughs> that there is a carnival for shoes. <laughs> the name of a store, Lauren. It's okay. a store. Have you ever seen those like booths where you get in and like they make you grab the tickets, the wind is blowing, they make you grab tickets or they make you grab the dollars? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> okay. Well, it's like, that's how I feel sometimes when all these thoughts are going through my head and I've got to grab on to these thoughts or grab on, just like oh, grabbing right. onto the dollars or the tickets yes, or whatever. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's how I explain it. Like whenever I'm talking to my mom or to my husband and I can't quite say how I'm feeling, but what you're doing requires you to sit down and say, okay, right now I'm feeling 
this. And I think it's empowering really because you're in charge of saying what kind of emotion you're feeling. And then, like I said, finding the matching coping skills. So I'm going to do that because not just now, but I think in the future, that's something that I'm taking away. Mm-hmm. And I, I would say um, too, to always start small. I know like yeah. people are in many different circumstances. I don't have kids and I know that I have different privileges and like circumstances that other people don't have. So I think even if it's a, a morning or an evening check-in, I think that like before you go to bed or while you're drinking your like coffee or um, eating breakfast in the morning, like it's a very quick thing. It doesn't have to be a very intense process but you can yeah. it can it can be that way if you want it to be yeah that's so good um i wanted to talk about the compassion fatigue too i think as educators you know we talked about how we're trying to make you a school counselor because you're so great at talking about these feelings and what to do with them and kim you said you know as educators that it's just we are all things and i think that with that comes that heavy dose of compassion and if if we um we can never do enough there's always more that we can do and that gives us a huge dose of guilt which leads to that compassion fatigue and i know i say it a lot but also just a paralysis where you think well i can't solve all the problems so i'm not going to do anything and i think it's just important to like you said start small and do what we can do so that was really good too and and you know we're not called to do everything we're called to do something right right so not every need is my compelled to do something because there's so many there's so many needs that are coming at you you have to do what you feel like you can go ahead laura go ahead it's it's my time to shine now Um, but laura (laughs) Um, with the dialectical thinking I had seen something last week that really just eased the pressure that I didn't even know that I was feeling but it said it was kind of like you can do this and this so you can enjoy being home with your kids right now but they can also get on your nerves and I was like okay yes okay that makes sense because I am loving this time with them and I'm loving learning more about their personalities. But at the same time, I'm like, you're going to have to get away for just a minute. Y'all are crawling all over me. You're going to have to go. So, but that, it, it's like, like I said, it just released this pressure I didn't even know I had. Right. Yeah. And even let's replacing it. Like when you said it, you said, that I can enjoy this time with my kids, but they're getting my, on my nerves. Even changing that, but to just an and, right? Like I yeah. enjoy having the time at home with my family and they get on my nerves. And so it's just because the butt can sometimes can be like a, a signal of like, Oh, but you know, it's, you know, like, like there, here's this like negative kind of thing. Just, just that tiny word can make a difference. You are and so, so, I, right. so yeah, Laura, I, the name of this podcast is Laura needs to change her butt. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, it's interesting <laughs> because I try to be very careful about using the word, but because, um, Several years ago, somebody that I look at a lot shared with me that when you say the word but, sometimes it can make people feel as though everything you said before that isn't yes. true. Yes. And so I try to be very careful using the word but. I've, and just this morning, I was sending a text and I said something great. And then I said, that and I was like, Mm-mm, we're taking that out. So I, I, am, I am careful about saying that word. But I didn't catch that's it. What, and that's why it's the dialectics because both statements are true. Yeah. So if, if the but is negating the truth of the previous statement, then then you're then you're not doing a dialectical thinking because then you're saying that that previous was not true. But in dialectical thinking, it's acceptance and change of both statements are true. Oh, I love it. So good. Very good. Thank you, Lauren. Well, I had written this blog post about uh, just giving educators uh, just telling them it's okay to grieve because Mm -hmm. when the summer hits educators don't really rest they start making plans and there's all this anticipation and you go into the school year with plans and I started thinking about how and I don't want to minimize 
people who have actually died from this. I don't want to minimize that kind of loss at all. But I did notice that when it was announced in our state that we're not going back to school, the educators that are on my social media started saying things that I thought, man, that is grief because they're saying, I just wanted another hug. I don't get to hug them again. I, I thought I'd have more time. And I thought those are grief statements. And so when I looked at, and now even, you know, we're a week out from that announcement, but I'm still, I'm seeing these educators have gone through a version of the stages of grief. And so as counselors, we just wanted to kind of walk them through, hey, it's okay to grieve and here's what you can do with your anger or with your shock or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that'll be out soon, today. And, and in what you just said, Laura, um, I, I have seen some um, posts where folks have gone back and forth, like get over it, teacher. People are, you know, dying and we don't want to hear that you're sad but if you use your your what we're talking about in this thinking and and somebody responded with we i'm capable of doing both i am very saddened that this has happened to our country and that i am aware that people are losing family and 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 careers and and in economic distress and I am sad that I did not get to finish my school year out with my students. And, right. and so it's okay to feel both of those things. And people need to understand that it's okay. You know, and, and I thought that was a great response that the person had put. It, no, we're not saying just because you know, it's both. So yeah. anyway, uh, Lauren, thank you so much. Thank you for this article and congratulations. She did not even know where all it had been posted and, and where we, she did not know that it had been posted in this common sense. Art of You're famous, Lauren. You're famous. <laughs> yeah, the, are you the first to tell you, Lauren? This is... I mean... Now you're, famous, I, you're famous among our five listeners, so... <laughs> That's so, so funny. So, Lauren... Um, let me ask you about how now are you from New Orleans? And no, I'm I'm not Southern it's enough to say it's no. Can I say New hey. Orleans? Because I feel like I've been there enough. Please don't. <laughs> so where are you exactly from in Louisiana? Um I live in Metairie, but I teach in New Orleans. Um and I'm originally actually from upstate New York. So I was born and raised in upstate New York. I went to college there. And Where'd I'm you go to college? Um I'm a graduate of the University of Rochester. Okay. Yeah. Uh so tell us how we, we have heard a lot about New Orleans on the news. Um a lot of cases um that are coming um, so our hearts go out to you. Uh, we know that y'all are in the battle and the trenches of this. How is the, your city doing? Do you think? Um, it's, it's very, this month is, this month of March felt very weird because it didn't really start like the way that it ended. Um, and, uh, I am just it's that the cases have risen so much and you know only i think three weeks ago like i was actually um with a bunch of other teachers at the governor's mansion the day that he declared the state of emergency um we had an, an honor at our state board of education meeting and we had like a nice um uh get together at the governor's mansion with the first lady and so just to think that that was happening on march 11th and now it's you know april the second and this has happened um i do appreciate that our governor made the decisive call um when he did which was two days after that event that i was at to suspend the instructional requirement um for minutes um for, for school day and and then you know soon thereafter there was the the call to um to not have the state testing i think that we have to list. We had to list lift some of those anxieties and burdens off of our education system. Um, so 
uh, I'm definitely thankful that we have a governor um, who's was also a teacher. Um, so I know that she informs a lot of his decisions a lot of times on education. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I'm my, I think that we are a very resilient city and we have obviously gone through many things. I think the hard thing right now is a lot of people show their, um, show their sorrow or show their, um, their, their feelings when things are hard through their community and show it through love and, and through festivals and through those types of things. And we can't do that right now. And I think that that's really, really hard. Um, so I think that, um, I, I think that that's a really difficult piece is that everyone's having to be inside and, and not band together the way that people are usually, um, you know, used to doing in our, in our community. So I think that that's a, a, a piece that is, that people are trying to understand. And we are losing, we're losing cultural bearers. We're losing, um, we're losing really, um, we're losing so many people. And I know even that's happening to students. And that's why I think when you said, we're going to get back to this piece with academics, let's address the, the big picture. Uh, and I'm just trying to be really mindful about that with, um, knowing that our kids will, the academic gaps will be able to fill those in. Uh, what kinds of things can we be doing though, proactively to address the, the things that our students are experiencing and our parents are experiencing right now, um, that is also shifting and changing on a day-to-day -day basis. We are very much a city that relies on our, you know, our families, our families are the people who are providing all of the labor and the resources and, and, and making this economy run in our state. So uh, I think it hopefully to me will signal to the decision makers that, and the people who make, you know, policy that this city is, is lifted up by the people who are losing their jobs like the most. And, and so that's, that's what I'm hoping to comes out of it um you know it, it's it's really eye-opening for I think people who weren't open to some of these discussions before a lot of things changing a lot of mindsets changing our thoughts and prayers are with your with your city and your school system I, and I know you guys are in the trenches and um thank you so much Lauren for coming on Laura anything else I want to give you ample opportunity this has just been wonderful. My brain is going in so many different directions and I'm thinking about future podcasts. We would love to have you on again, um, maybe after all this passes, to talk about the relationship between school counselors and special education teachers. That's where my mind has been going too. Um, That's great. Yeah, we, Laura, I like that. <clears throat> yeah. So I hope that this is just the beginning of a wonderful friendship between the three of us yes. and we can get back together. Soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this. Thank you. Laura. Well, you have been. If there's anything we can do for you and we do want to hear when this is all over and our kids are back in school to see how you guys are, are faring and uh, yeah. good luck on your fellowship. And thank you for telling us a little bit more about, uh, about that program and that's exciting and and we learned some new things from you so thank yeah. you okay thank you guys. So much. like you had been up at 6 a.m oh i was that oh well, that's your problem victoria bell has slept until 12 30 and one o'clock every single day uh, okay well i'll try not to break break confidentiality with my own child anyway are so ill listeners so ill go she um sleeps until 12 30 and one o'clock every day but today she had a zoom call at 10 30 with her class so she was up with the chickens today ready to go i was up with the chickens she decided she wanted to work out with me i'm just gonna let that sink in for a second so we had to find her a workout outfit. We had to find her a headband to put around her head. I could not find her a headband. My 30-minute workout turned into an hour-and-a-half workout. 
when she kept needing me to stop for things. Then Ellie Blair wakes up and she came down and needed her iPad and her muffins and her chocolate milk and everything. And, but I'm so glad my husband was able to sleep a little bit longer. I'm so oh, glad. Yeah. Well, I want, I, we want to make sure that they, not a clue. And I'm thinking what is going on here when I'm not here with these people? Well, yeah. Like, how, 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 how do y'all function? I don't know. So our cat pick of the, tell, tell, tell me your cat pick first, Laura. Okay, my cat pick of the week is basically me right now. This is how to make your cat look more active. <laughs> and it's a cat with all these drawings underneath it. So it looks like the cat's swimming. It looks like the cat is reading a book. It makes cats useful because I'm sorry if you're a cat lover. Yes. They're not, they don't serve much of a purpose. And this is mine. It says I walked on I walked in on him like this. And I oh. swear it is literally I have walked in on my husband. Like just like oh. Since oh my goodness. Home <laughs> together. It's like let me out. Let me out. Um, so what is your pick of the day? My pick is something that's actually going on here in my own town. And it's called a bear hunt. And I think I've seen it happening in lots of other places, but I'm super excited about taking my girls out in a little bit. And from the confines of our car, people in our community have put stuffed animals out in their yard or hung them up in their windows. Or So anyway, we're actually going to go on a bear hunt and see how many bears we can find. Uh, but I just think it's so great. Yet another example of a community coming together and doing something for each other. I was waving at my mother. I love that, and we're gonna go on the bear hunt also. So, not with you, in the confines nope. of my own car. Yep. So my pick of the week is, my mother is outside, and that's she's waving at me. That's how I have to see my mother. So well, I turn the computer around so I can wave at her too. Well, she got on down. I'm sorry. Okay. So this book, I, I know, you know, we were told that we still have our fee cards if we've not spent them. So some folks may have uh, money for books. And this is called Sometimes You Fly uh, by Catherine Applegate. And um, it's, it's growing up isn't always easy. Sometimes you have to try many times before you fly. And this is a very... Um, practical way to tell kids that a, you're not going to get to point from A to B without this, this, this happening. So it, it's just like you're not, going, you're not going to, you know, get on the team until you've practiced. You're not going to, you know, uh, drive a car until you've ridden in it and learned how to drive. And the illustrations are really good. So it's, you know, it's telling kids that there has to be some effort, you know, before you can actually do, do the end product. So it was a really good book that I just recently discovered. That so, is what, good. so what is your, that's my pick, but do you have a pick or do you have a, that was your pick about the bear hunt. Now yeah. your tip trick. My tip trick and technique is something that I learned from the legendary Dr. Townsend. Um, and if you believe, listen to more than one of our podcasts and you've probably heard me talk about her, but she was my very favorite uh, professor when I was getting my counseling degree. And she would do this very often where she would just have a night where we talked about different practical hands-on techniques and things that you can keep in your office. And one of them was a filter. And um, like Kim said, a coffee filter would work, but the purpose of a filter is to catch what doesn't need to go through and just to allow the good stuff through. So um, I'm not really a coffee drinker, but I don't think coffee grounds are supposed to go through. So it catches the coffee grounds and lets through the good coffee water. Um, and so it's the same thing with our thoughts. A coffee filter can show students 
that we're going to catch the bad thoughts. We're going to catch that negative talk. We're going to catch, um, catch the things that people have said about you. And we're going to let through what you know to be true or, you know, you help guide them to what is true and just let the good through. And even right now with this time that's scary, I think that would be a good thing to share with your students that, Hey, there are scary thoughts out there and we can't control those. So we're going to leave everything we can't control here in our filter. And we're going to let through what we can control. And those things are our attitude or, you know, that we will follow the rules and things like that. That is so great. Um, that's a, that's I wish you could have gone to school with me. I will, you know, I did the online for and it. We didn't have as many like, opportunities for that. Like, I think what you did was so special and, and you did have a, such a great teacher, but um, instructor. But I love that idea about the filter. I mean, that's such yeah. a simple thing that we can do. Laura, I enjoyed it as always. It is always a pleasure. It's so good to see you. It's been a while. It has. Hey, I want to give a little teaser for an upcoming podcast. Can is I do it, that? Is this clean? Is this clean? It's clean. It's, okay. I'll clean it up. Clean. Clean it up. We have scheduled an interview with the Brian Perlman who, if you've been around us for five minutes, we've talked about the book, Whatever It Takes. If you haven't read it, then you have approximately, what, a few days to read it, and it will change your whole thinking. And so he's going to be on our podcast next week, and I, it's like Christmas. I'm not going to sleep. I'm so excited. This is so exciting. We are such fans. So, yeah. I mean, we're so honored that he's going to be on our podcast. So tease away, Laura, tease away. <laughs> oh, a little something to look forward to. Yeah. All right. no. We will see you next time.